Well, come on up here, Mr. Cluey. You have spoken out and raised your voice for those who have been disenfranchised and called lesser and denied their basic humanity. And that is unusual for one of your stature. That is unusual for one of your fame. And God damn it, I'm glad you are who you are. Thank you. Welcome. So a little bit about me, um, I grew up in Southern California and I actually never grew up with any sort of religion. My, uh, my parents never really cared, I don't think. Um, they encouraged me to read books, they encouraged me to study and work hard in school, but religion was not really a thing I worried about. And I uh, got to high school, never worried about it, got to college, never worried about it. Uh, I worried about actually a little bit because my wife is uh, Mexican Catholic, so I had, to, uh, <laughs> I had to learn about it, but I'd learned about it, you know, the, the various different types of religions up to that point. And for me, I'm, I like to describe myself as cheerfully agnostic because I think that all the major religions, their view of what God is, is bullshit, to be frank. You are a human being inside a universe you know next to nothing about, and you're telling me that you understand this omnipotent being who created what you're living in. No, that does not compute. That does not make sense. If you were in a place to understand that omnipotent being, you would effectively be outside of the universe, able to tell me what every single quark gluon interaction is doing from the very instant the universe started up until the very instant the universe ends. At that point, you are that deity. So it doesn't really matter. Who gives a shit? The only thing you can affect is your actions, what you do with your life. And then on the flip side, if there isn't a God, and there, frankly, um, I know a lot of people will disagree, there is no proof that says there isn't a God. Because in order to make that argument, in order to have that proof, you run into the exact same problem. You have to show every single thing that is in the universe in order to show that there is no God. But again, it doesn't matter. The only thing you can affect are your own actions, how you live your life. So, that's why I'm cheerfully agnostic. I, I honestly, it, it, I don't care either way. What I care about is how you treat other people, because that is what influences us as people. Now, to the actual subject of what I want to talk about, empathy, and why empathy is important. Um, very simply put, empathy is important because if we as a species do not make a conscious choice to practice empathy, then we will die. It's that simple. And the example I like to use, the argument I like to make, is uh, how many of you here are familiar with Fermi's paradox? The idea, show of hands, those familiar with Fermi's Paradox? For those who don't know Fermi's Paradox, it's the idea that the universe is so vast and has existed on such a long time scale that we should have seen evidence of other intelligent life out there. We should have seen evidence of a Kardashev Type 2 or possibly a Kardashev Type 3 civilization. Some, someone building a, dice, a partial Dyson Sphere, including their, their sun, collecting solar energy some sort of artifact that will let us know that here was a species that lasted for not just thousands of years, not just hundreds of thousands of years, but millions of years, made it out in, into space, and there is evidence that they were there or are still there. We have seen nothing of that. And the reason, I believe, that we have seen nothing of that is the fact that we are intelligent life. In order for intelligent life to evolve from the very first single-celled organism, we develop tools. We develop weapons. We then use those weapons because we have to use those weapons to take control of our environment. A human being facing a lion is pretty much lunch for the lion. The lion's going to go away very, very satisfied. A human being with a spear facing a lion now has a very warm coat and food to eat for the next couple days. The human being has weapons. He has used those weapons. And we have consistently done that throughout the entirety of our history. Every time we build a better tool, we use it in ways to both build ourselves up by creating be better opportunities for people and also to kill ourselves. I mean, that, that is a constant. You, you can look at history and, and see that. I mean, 20,000 years ago, we're beating each other to death with the jawbones of animals that we managed to kill. 2,000 years ago, Roman legionaries marching across the, you know, the plains of Europe and conquering everyone, using swords, crucifying people they don't agree with. 
200 years ago, we have machine guns and muskets and can well, not machine guns, yeah, we have muskets, cannons, gunpowder. We're starting to blow each other up. Then we have napalm, we have machine guns, then we have atomic weaponry. As you can see, we are developing these weapons and we always use these weapons. We always push the button. And our science is just getting better and better and better. You heard, uh, you heard Dave talk on the first day about how atheism is on the hockey stick. It's you know, what's known as exponential progression. You're going and then boom, you have this giant explosion of growth. Now we are doing the same thing in our technological progression right now. We have been advancing very steadily and in the last 50 years, our technological progression has been huge. We are increasing at, at a highly exponential pace. Now our empathic progression has been very linear. It's been a straight line, kind of dips and bumps when we've had wars and periods of peace. So there's this gap between our technological progression and our empathic progression. And how does this relate to Fermi's paradox? Well, as our technological progression gets higher and higher and higher, we will one day develop a weapon that will kill everybody on Earth if someone pushes the button. And it is a 100% guarantee that someone will push the button, because someone always pushes the button. <laughs> my, my favorite example of this is during uh, World War II, during the Manhattan Project. A couple of the scientists were worried that if they detonated a nuclear weapon, it would ignite the Earth's atmosphere and scorch the planet in a biblical firestorm. It would kill everybody. But they detonated it anyways because they felt they had to. <laughs> we're still standing here, so you know we, we, we didn't scorch the Earth, but who's to say what's going to happen when we get out into space? We start capturing asteroids and mining them for resources. And someone figures out an asteroid is a very good kinetic weapon that you can drop on a planet. What happens when we're moving more into genetic engineering and bioengineering? And someone somewhere says, you know what would be really great for ethnic cleansing? If we turned off the gene that made women fertile. That would be a really good move. And then that gene jumps to the rest of the population and now we're screwed. Or we're going into nanomachines. The Grey Goose scenario. Endlessly replicating nanomachines that get out of control and consume the entire world. Yes, it's science fiction, but we are making those right now. We're trying to make machines that can build themselves. And if you don't know why you shouldn't push the button, someone pushes the button. So, all these alien species out there that we have seen no signs of their life, when we should have seen signs of their life, it's very simple why we don't see signs of them. They did not develop a conscious choice to increase empathy to keep pace with their technological progression. And someone pushed the button. It's built into intelligent life you're going to push the button. It's right there, it's glowing, it says push me, I'm red. <laughs> and, and it has to be a conscious choice for us to choose empathy because evolution does not work on very short time scales. Evolution is very long term, it takes a while. Our technological progression is very short term, it's happening very quickly. I, I can remember when I was a kid, the idea of calling someone up and talking to them meant I had to be at home on the landline telephone and I had to hope that they were home too so they could then pick up an answer. Now I have a cell phone. When I was a kid, the idea of having a device in my pocket that would allow me to access the entire store of human knowledge, if I can run an optimized Google search and recognize source bias, <laughs> no one thinks about that, but here we are. So, our technological progression is showing no signs of slowing down. Our empathic progression, however, is getting worse and worse and worse. We, we're, we're not increasing at the same rate. And a huge problem with that, especially as relates to theism and in, in some parts atheism, is the idea of fundamentalism. Religion is not the enemy. Fundamentalism is the enemy. Religion can be very helpful to a lot of people because, to be frank, we are in a cold, uncaring universe that is trying to kill us at every step of the way. <laughs> there, there are so many things out there that will kill you. And we look at that and say, you know what, that really sucks. And for a lot of people, the way they get through that is they, they build communities. They want to find a way to make sense of a world that really doesn't make sense. And you run into problems with fundamentalism, not with the idea of forming communities. Um, I'd like to actually read you a, uh, a passage from one of Terry Pratchett's books. It's called uh, Hogfather. He's a great author. And um, it, really, it really sums up a lot of kind of as human beings, the, the, way, the way we look at the world in, in terms of religion and, and just searching for a meaning. And so here's the passage. All right, said Susan. I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. And she's talking to death, her grandfather. It's complicated. Death says, really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? 
No, humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies? Hogfathers? Little? Yes, as practice. You have to start out learning to believe the little lies, so we can believe the big ones? Yes, justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder, and sieve it through the finest sieve, and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. And yet you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some rightness in the universe by which it may be judged. Yes, but people have got to believe that, or what's the point? My point exactly. And so for a lot of people, religion is the little lie that they believe, because what it does is it allows them to believe in the bigger lies of justice and fairness and mercy. Those are not inherently human traits. Those are things we made up to try to get along with each other, to try to make our lives more bearable. If you put a human being in a situation where they have no concept of justice or mercy or fairness, well, we've seen that happen in our, in our history. It's not inherent to us. We have no obligation to make other people's lives better. And you see that happening over and over where people don't do that. You see that in people not understanding why they should treat others fairly, in discrimination against women, against gay people, against those of other races, against those with other beliefs. And it all boils down to the fact that people aren't practicing empathy. And again, it has to be a conscious choice to practice that empathy. So as atheists, as theists, as agnostics, we all have to be working together to say to the fundamentalists, no, you do not represent us. Your views do not represent our views. If I'm a Christian, I, it is my duty to tell the fundamentalist Christians, no, you do not represent my religion. You do not get to say to other people that we are going to deny you your right to practice free will. Because if we allow that, then one day someone will be saying to us, you are not allowed to practice your free will. Everyone has to have that same freedom. Otherwise, no one has that freedom. And that is why I speak up on that. That's why I encourage other people to speak up on it. That's why I encourage people to practice empathy and to think about empathy. Because, again, if I don't speak for others who are being oppressed, how am I going to expect them to speak for me when I am being oppressed? It doesn't work. It would make me a hypocrite. So we, we have to recognize that. It takes all of us to recognize that. It takes all of us working together to recognize that and understanding that, yes, you can believe what you want to believe, but it is your actions you will be judged by. And if your actions are depriving another human being of their opportunity to practice their free will, well, then those actions will not be tolerated because it is self-destructive to our society as a whole. So anyways, that's, that's my spiel. I don't, I don't really do a lot of talking. I just think that... Uh, Empathy is kind of an important thing because I would like to see our planet succeed. And um, yeah, right now, not, not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're in kind of a shitty place. Um, and, and, and really, it's, it's, also about, it's also about valuing long-term consequences over short-term gains. And, and I mean, it, it's important because Right now, I mean, right now, we're in the middle of climate change. We're in the middle of those long-term consequences, and they will continue happening over the next 50, 100, 150, 200 years, and we're not doing anything about them because it's more profitable for a lot of people to keep profiting off the current system, to say that these short-term gains are making my life better, but everyone else's life miserable, but I don't care about them because I don't practice empathy, so I'm going to continue doing this. And then 50 years down the line, when coastal regions are underwater, and there's wars going on because of food shortages, and the world is falling once again into chaos because we didn't think ahead, because we're not programmed to think ahead, we're programmed to think of the now, well, we're going to wonder, boy, wouldn't it have been great if we had thought ahead earlier? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been awesome to do that if more people thought that way? And so we have to encourage each other to make that conscious choice, because left to our own devices, we won't. I mean, it's, it's very simple. History shows us that we won't. So we, we have to make that choice. So, yep, that's, uh, that, that's all I have to say. Just treat other people the way you want to, you want to be treated. It's a golden rule. It's pretty simple. And, um, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions or anything, I, I love doing question and answer. We could, we could debate with Matt. That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Blaze Orange have been passing out note cards. 
and kind of same deal. There are questions. I'll be taking them and asking them of our speaker. But um, since I'm here, I get to ask the first sure. one. Well, I, I asked it of, of Mark White of the Spin Doctors. I'm going to ask it of you too. Your colleagues a lot of times will say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me catch the ball. Um, never mind mom who paid my fees and dad who drove me and me for doing the damn work. What's your take on that? Because it just ticks me off, but that's just me. It's, um, it's annoying in the fact that if you truly believe in this omnipotent deity, then that deity simultaneously gives a absolute no shits about you. Does not care in the least what you're doing because there's so much else going on, but also at the same time loves you very much because does know everything that's going on. So the idea that a football game is somehow more important than children dying of starvation or people being oppressed, well, that's kind of stupid. That's, I, I, I think it's really just not a good idea. And what it also does is it, it makes people think that religion is, is or, or that the idea of, of a god or the idea of prayer is, is useful for sporting events, which are a children's game. These are not important. <laughs> We run around and entertain a lot of people, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm not really doing a whole lot out there when I kick the football that a doctor is probably contributing a lot more to society than I am. <laughs> like, but, but again, people value those short-term gains. They, they value you know, the fact that we are athletes as opposed to the long-term consequences of bread and circuses. We know how that ends up. Rome is a very good example of bread and circuses. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of athletes thanking Jesus after, after they've, they've succeeded. But for a lot of guys, it makes them feel better. And at the same time, you know, I'm not going to tell them they can't do it because maybe it does make them feel better. And I'm not going to tell them how they're going to live their life because I, I want the same respect. Now, if they tell me I have to thank Jesus after punting a football, I'm be like, fuck no. <laughs> but ha have you been in that situation? I mean, uh, there, there are a number of... You know, perhaps not at the NFL level, but uh, at, at the high school level, at the college level, where if you don't bow down and, and take part in that circle, um, your line ain't going to protect you, and you're not going to have a very long career. Um, I, I think that's more to do with coaching. Um, all the coaches I've had have made it very clear that, um, you know, say, say your own prayer in your own particular way if you happen to be religious. If not, you don't have to. Um, but it's more a team bonding circumstance fact that everyone is coming together because we're about to go out and run into other people at very high rates of speed. That kind of sucks. <laughs> so, so it's like, okay, we, we need to work together as a team. And um, I mean, case in point, in the Vikings, they, they had a, uh, you know, they'd say the Lord's Prayer before every game. And I, I knew guys on the team who were openly atheists. They, you know, they'd kneel down and hold hands because you're part of the team. Our owner would kneel down and do it. He's Jewish. I mean, it's, 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 it's about recognizing the camaraderie as, as opposed to saying this is something you have to do to be part of the group because you have to believe these certain things. It's no, we're, we're a group. Some of the group likes doing this, and we're going along with it because we know that you like doing it. We're not going to say you can't do it, and they're not going to say you have to do it. So. What did you do? I knelt down, grabbed my teammate's hand, and just stared around the room. And you could always tell who the atheists were, the non-believers, because they'd be staring around the room too. <laughs> You're clearly a thinker. Um, you've got a good head on your shoulders. Um, League of Denial, that mm. whole thing about the concussions and the, and the yep. helmets and the fact that evidence was suppressed mm. by the NFL. I, I am only going to get this chance once. Yeah. Talk about that because I oh, want to know your thoughts. Sure. So my thoughts, again, another perfect example of valuing short-term gains over long-term consequences. Yeah. The NFL knows that CTE is a problem. The NFL knew that while the older guys were playing. They knew that these guys were having brain injuries, but because the game was profitable, they didn't tell them because then people may have stopped watching. People may have stopped playing. And now you're facing the long-term long consequences where this is all coming out and all of a sudden, parents are saying, wait a minute, maybe I don't want my kid to play football because there's a chance they could end up like these guys who are committing suicide or who can't remember their own names or can't remember their family members. And Case in point, for the last two years, uh, I believe Pee Wee football attendance has been down 20% over the last two years. And the NFL knows that. And they know that it will kill the game. And that's also why you're seeing a lot of the uh, commercials now about play 60 and proper tackling form. Because they're trying to convince parents that, look, we're going to make this game safe. Keep having your children play it. But you can't ever make football safe. 
You're, you're running into someone at a high rate of speed, directly opposing each other, and you can't pad the inside of your skull. Your brain's going to smack into the bone, and then boom, you got a concussion. There's no way to prevent that from happening playing football. So the league's doing everything they can to create the perception that they're going to prevent that, but in actuality, they won't. And what they're worried about is enough people figuring that out and then saying, we don't value this entertainment as highly anymore, and now we're going to go do something else. Those are the long-term consequences. So I think they knew a lot. I really hope one of the older guys doesn't take the settlement and insists on taking it, the, the law, lawsuit all the way through so we can find out just how much the NFL knew and when it knew it. Because I know a lot of players who play are absolutely convinced the NFL knew that a long time before they, you know, they admitted to it. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's about accountability. Yeah, of course. Okay. We've got a couple very good questions, but this one is just so cute and it's written in pink ink, so I'm going to share this. I love you. You're the only sports hero I've ever had. P.S. Yes, I know that wasn't a question. Okay. <laughs> if, if I can address that for a moment. <laughs> No, it's um so the idea of a sports figure being a role model, what does that say about our society? The fact that just because you run really fast or you can throw a ball really far or you can hit someone really hard, that now your children should be looking up to this person because of their physical abilities? What about their mental abilities? I mean, you, you hear about all these stories of high school athletes and college athletes who get away with crimes, they get away with rape, they get away with, you know, treating other people very poorly, and it's constantly overlooked, not just by the media, but by their own communities, because they can run really fast, or throw a ball really far, or hit someone really hard. And until that changes in those communities, until we demand that that changes, well, you're going to continue getting role models, because we look at football players as role models, who are absolutely horrible human beings because they've never been raised to be any different. Their entire life, every time they've gotten in trouble, they've been told you will not face the consequences for your actions. They've been shown that it doesn't matter what you do as long as you can continue to run fast. So then why are we surprised when they keep acting the same way? I mean, they've been conditioned to do that. So we need to change that if you want athletes to be role models. We'll demand that they be role models. Demand that they do the right thing. No, we, we want you up here. Yeah, no, keep expound. I'm just, I'm just keeping the questions going. Which brings me to, do you think you'll ever play pro football again? No. Why? So, the reason I won't play pro football again is because generally when you write a letter titled I was fired by two cowards and a bigot, referring to <laughs> <laughs> referring to your GM, your head coach, and your special teams coach, odds are that uh, you're probably not going to get that chance. Um, but the thing is, is that I had noticed that I probably wasn't going to get that chance anyways last year because I went to several tryouts and there, there was one in particular that I definitely felt I was the best punter out on the field. I had this job. The, con the conditions were right. The team was making a run into the playoffs. They needed a veteran guy. They needed someone who had been in the playoffs before and I had done really well in the tryout. There were four other guys there. And they went with a younger guy. It's like, okay, fine, whatever. Maybe they just wanted a younger guy. They just didn't want to spend the money. The guy ends up shanking a punt two weeks later and he shanked a couple in the tryouts. I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that's, that's what he did. And the team cut him. And then they brought in a veteran guy who wasn't at the tryouts, who wasn't me. And it's a, it's a little, you know, maybe a little egotistical, but my stats had been better than the other guys for the entirety of my career. We would have cost the same amount of money. They had just seen how I could still punt and they didn't bring me in. So I'm like, okay, at this point, if the bridges are already crumbling, well, I'm going to throw some gasoline on them before I go. <laughs> that's how I do this. <laughs> yeah, probably not funny. Okay. Chris, do you believe Adrian Peterson's influence on the team and his personal beliefs on homosexuals made Ziggy Watt release you? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think so, because I always got along great with AP, and um, you know, that, that's one thing that the guys in the locker room, I always got along with every one of my teammates, because they knew that these are things that I believe strongly on, 
but I wasn't going to proselytize at them in the locker room because we were there to play football. They, they understood that I respected their beliefs, and so they, they respected that. They respected that, you know, even if I didn't agree with what they were saying, I wasn't going to try to make them feel bad about it. And if they wanted to have that conversation, I was more than happy to have that conversation with them, but they would have to be the ones to initiate it. Because I understood, you know, a lot of guys didn't, didn't want to talk about same-sex rights in the locker room. They may have felt uncomfortable about it. They may have felt that, you know, I just don't want to talk about this here. And I was like, that's fine. We're here to play football. Other guys who want to talk about it, fine, let's talk about it. You know, we, we've got plenty of time to kill. We can, we can make this conversation happen. But no, I, I, don't, I don't think AP's beliefs had anything to do with me getting released because the other thing is that Ziggy Wolf is actually a very firm supporter of same-sex rights because he's actually donated money to groups that support same-sex rights. And that's a huge difference between saying you support same-sex rights and actually giving out your money because one of those, you know, you actually have some incentive to do that. So, uh, no, Zig Ziggy, I, I would be very surprised if, if that had any part in my release. Did you have any interaction with teammates or even opponents about same-sex rights that mm -hmm. you would like to share with us? Sure, yeah, 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 that's, that's, actually, that's a pretty good story. So, when the, uh, when the first letter came out, um, I had a bunch of guys come up to me in the locker room the day afterwards, and uh, about 40% of them, I'd say, said, we may not agree with you on the same-sex rights issue, but we really appreciate you speaking out for Brendan, the, the player I was kind of defending, because they recognized it was a First Amendment issue. For those of you unfamiliar with the first letter I wrote, essentially a uh, delegate of Maryland, a member of the United States government, wrote the Ravens a letter saying, this player should not be allowed to speak out on this issue. Football players are only supposed to play football. Now, I was a little peeved at the fact that an elected U.S. official did not understand the First Amendment, which is a little troubling. And then secondly, why do you care? So, I mean, this, this isn't going to affect your life in any material way, shape, or form. Why are you trying to oppress other people? So anyway, so I, I wrote that letter. So about 40% of my teammates, you know, didn't agree with the same-sex rights, but appreciated the First Amendment view. 60% who came up said, we agree with everything you did. We think that that was the right move. And then I also had guys from other teams come up to me before games, like one, one game. So I'm, I'm warming up before the game. This 310-pound defensive lineman comes trotting over from the other team. Now, normally, defensive linemen from the other team don't come over to talk to the punter before the game. <laughs> and so, so this guy comes, you know, comes jogging up. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, man. Just want to say, great job on that letter. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you. Please don't kill me. <laughs> So yeah, and, and actually that, that's one thing about um, the locker room in the NFL is that it is a very young place. It's composed of primarily 21, 22, 23-year-old men right out of college. And so you see that these societal shifts that are happening, you can almost see them happening in real time in the locker room because it's this constant influx of a younger generation. And what I've seen from my time in the NFL is that when I first came in, there was a lot of homosexual language in terms of, you know, making fun of players, making fun of guys, saying that's gay or no homo. But as the eight years passed that I played, it got less and less and less because players have had gay teammates. They have gay family members. They have gay friends. They understand that this isn't something that you should oppress someone for, just like we don't oppress someone for their skin color or ideally for their religious beliefs or lack thereof. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about everyone having that same freedom to live their own life. And guys are slowly starting to pick that up in terms of same-sex rights. So it's, the locker room's a, a much better place than it used to be. The front office and coaching staffs, however, are a slightly different story. All right. Because they're mainly old white men. <laughs> no offense to the old white men out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Michael Sale. What are your thoughts? What do you think he's going to experience in the NFL? Um, I think hopefully he'll be given a fair shot by at least two or three teams in terms of the draft process because he's shown he can play football and uh, he's, he's more of a project guy who should be drafted in like the third to fifth round, which is where he was projected to go. And the NFL has a history of drafting guys who are projects in the third to fifth round. And if he slips below that, then we'll know there's something else going on because it doesn't match the previous facts. It doesn't match the previous evidence. And I think once he gets to a team, the team will know, okay, this is Michael Sam, he's a football player who also happens to be gay. We'll be able to talk to our team about it, and ideally their head coach is on the same page and says in that very first team meeting, look, here's Michael Sam. You're going to get questions about him because he happens to be gay, but we are a football team. And if you don't like Michael Sam, if you think this is a problem, well, then you are free to leave. You don't have to be on this team. 
and treating it exactly the same way Jackie Robinson was treated with the Dodgers. So. Unscientific question. Sure. Prognosticate for me. Okay. Thank you. How many atheists are in the NFL? Um, let's see. I know I know of two personally, um, and just on one team. So extrapolating from that, say there's 1,800 people in the NFL. Um, I'd say probably, call it maybe maybe 10 percent. So 180 guys. I'd say it's probably probably around there. That's uh, not a bad number. No, no. I mean, it, well, and then also, you know, if you consider like front offices and, and coaches and GMs, there's probably a couple more there. So it's, uh, I'd say probably about 10% is, is right around where it's at. Very well. Yeah. Very well. Um, okay. I want to go back to your thoughts on empathy mm -hmm. and uh, humanity and whatnot. Here, here is a really great question. Uh, yeah, here we go. I dropped it. Okay. Here we go. We are social animals and our survival depends on our social success. Empathy is the ultimate source of atheist ethics. Comment, if you will. Comment, if you will. Um, I'd say that's the case as long as you don't let atheism devolve into fundamentalism. If it becomes, we must get rid of religion, we must get rid of the way these people think, well then, now you're breeding conflict. Now you're breeding points of, of you know, opposition between different groups, and that has been a problem for us the entirety of human history. It has to be a, okay, you know what, I don't think you're right, I'm going to give you the evidence why, but I am not going to force you to give up your beliefs if, after everything else, you still don't do it. As long as you can act like a human being and treat those around you with empathy and, and understand why that's important, then at the end of it, your beliefs don't really matter because your beliefs are never going to, to change someone in terms of, of what you do. Your actions change someone. What you do to the people around you changes someone. I could believe in the flying spaghetti monster and it doesn't make a bit of difference how I treat the people around me. Well, then it's immaterial what I believe. All that matters are my actions. All that matters is that physical proof. So I think, um, I think empathy is at the core of atheism right now because atheism wants to have that fairness it wants to be treated equally to have that same chance to exercise free will but again it can't be allowed to devolve into fundamentalism because that is always a danger with any sort of belief system so. i like this question this is a good one who who asked this one uh, greatest hope. Who who wrote that one? It's in black ink, legible. Greatest hope. Stand up. Stand up. Okay. This gentleman in the back asked you this question, and I want you to answer him directly. Okay. What is the greatest hope you have for humanity? The greatest hope I have for humanity is that we understand what empathy is and frankly, vaccinate ourselves with empathy. So that way, if 90% of us know why something is wrong, we can keep that other 10% from pushing the button. So that societal pressure around them says, no, you can't be the next Stalin. You can't be the next Hitler. You can't be the next Pol Pot. Because that is ultimately self-destructive and it will kill us as a species. So my hope is that people understand the importance of empathy and work to cultivate it, not just in themselves, but in others, because if we don't, then we are doomed. It's a very simple equation. And we have to solve it because it's not going to magically appear one day just because we hope it does. It, it's something we have to work at. So that is my greatest hope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before I let you go, I want David Silverman, the non-animator, president of American Atheists, um, to come up here. He has a little something that I'm going to let him talk all about. David? Thank you, Jamila. Yay. Well, uh, Chris, we had something for you last night, but unfortunately uh, you had a hot date with a deck of Magic the Gathering playing cards. I was playing a lot of Commander. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I would like to, uh, first of all, great speech. Great speech. Thank you. Also, by the way, great book. Oh, I have thanks. read your book. Uh, the book is excellent, and I hope you all read it. I hope you all buy it. But 
I want to express my personal appreciation to you uh, and present you with uh, the American Atheist First Amendment Award for your outspoken, passionate, and unapolog unapologetic defense of the rights of all Americans. Thank you for all you do. Thank you.